Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we have a special topic, the hazards of using sodium hydride in DMSO, DMF, and dimethyl acetamide. This is a topic I had mentioned in Lecture 10. If anyone is interested in it, I would make a video about it, and so here we are. So before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems from last lecture. So in this first problem, we have this alkene, and under two different sets of conditions, we get, in one case, the 1,2-syn bromide, syn when it's drawn like this, and in the other case, we get the 1,2-anti bromide, dibromide. And so if you had drawn this in the linear form, it would end up being anti. It just depends on like how you draw it. And so that's why it's important to like keep the molecule in the same configuration so that you can understand why we're getting different products. So in the first case, what we could do is we could take this alkene and just treat it with a bromine in chloroform, and that would give us the 1,2-anti-bromide. However, if we wanted to get the other one, we'd have to do a couple steps. So first, we could do an updrawn dihydroxylation with osmium tetroxide in a catalytic amount using NMO to regenerate, regenerate it. Subsequently, you could treat it with uh, triphenylphosphine and carbon tetrabromide, which is the APEL reaction or APEL reaction, if you prefer. This will cause both of those to be inverted to the dibromide. Um, alternatively, if you could think of a way to convert this double bond into a triple bond and subsequently back into a trans double bond, then you'd be able to just do a normal Br2 bromination, because if you drew this in its linear form, it would give you the same product. Okay, the next problem is the bromination of this alkene here in the presence of water. And so this does what's known as the halohydrin reaction, and the water, or the halohydrin formation rather, and the water will add at the more substituted position in an anti-orientation relative to the bromine. In the final reaction here, we just have an alkene reacting with bromine, and the important thing to remember is that we get a 1,2 anti-product. Um, in this case, both bromines are added because there's no other competing nucleophile. So with that, let's get into today's special topic, the use of sodium hydride in DMSO, DMF, and dimethyl acetamide, uh, follow up to lecture 10. So there's two papers that, that kind of highlight risks. They're mentioned in several places, but the best paper is this 2019 paper from OPRD. Um, it's a good, good journal for uh, like research in an industrial setting, specifically for chemistry-related stuff. And they do a bunch of experiments to show that sodium hydride in DMSO, DMF, and dimethyl acetamide uh, can be really destructive. Um, they also mention that there's this earlier report from Chemical and Engineering News uh, in 1982, where a 2,500 liter reaction in a pilot plant had a large-scale runaway uh, using sodium hydride in DMF, and that caused the reactor's rupture disc to fail. Um, so there could be massive consequences. Someone may have gotten like killed or injured or potentially fired as a result of this because this is like a, a big deal having hazards like this happening. And industry hates it when you have dangerous chemistry. Okay, so essentially one of the things you can do to assess risk is you can do calorimetry. And so one type of calorimetry is accelerating rate calorimetry. And essentially what you can do is you can slowly heat up a sample in what's called a bomb. This is a bomb or a bomb flask and it's sealed. Uh, and then they can measure the pressure and the temperature of this compared to the external temperature of the oven that it's in. And so they gradually increase the heat, and then they can measure how quickly stuff happens in the bomb. Okay, so this can be useful if you're interested in determining the stability of your molecule on its own or in a mixture. Like, let's say you have some potential drug candidate. You want to know, is it going to be stable above 100 degrees Celsius? Um, a lot of the time, we just have the assumption that heating things above, like, 100 is probably not a good idea. But occasionally, chemistry requires harsher conditions. And so, you know, thermal stability is an important consideration. Uh, it's also important to know if gaseous products are formed, because if the decomposition occurs and gases are formed, that can be problematic because that can cause an increase in pressure in a sealed environment. Additionally, uh, if this is an exothermic process, this can cause the reaction to go faster and faster, which could be a runaway reaction, and that can be explosive. So why would you want to use DMSO, DMF, or dimethylacinamide? So these are really great solvents. They dissolve basically everything. People say water is the universal solvent, but the real universal solvent is DMSO. There's stuff that won't dissolve in water, but will still dissolve in DMSO. A number of drugs are used that way as well. So uh, the application of some medication, I mean, can be applied in a solution of DMSO uh, when, when necessary. Okay. So it's also really good at dissolving polar molecules that won't dissolve in other solvents or would react in other solvents, such as sodium hydride. So sodium hydride will dissolve. Um, in the case of DMSO, though, it actually reacts with the sodium hydride and it forms the dimsolate uh, ion, which is also good and soluble. 
Um, in the case of DMF and dimethylsidamide, when you have a solution of sodium hydride or a mixture of sodium hydride in, in these solvents, uh, it just makes the mixture unstable. Whether it's the sodium hydride or the DMF slash dimethylsidamide that's unstable, uh, it's not too, not super clear. Also, these run away really quickly. So uh, the temperatures that are reached are extremely high, extremely quickly. Um, and so strange reactions that we wouldn't normally think about can start occurring, such as the conversion of something like DMF to like methane or acetylene. And you might be like, what the heck is the mechanism of that? It's like, good question. When we're looking at temperatures above 300 degrees, it's not clear what's happening other than crap hitting the fan. So in the case of dimethylacetamide, they took a 16% mixture of sodium hydride with mineral oil. When you work with sodium hydride, it's typically available as a mixture in mineral oil. This makes it a little bit safer, safer to handle and easier to weigh out. Um, it will slowly react in air to form sodium hydroxide, but it's a convenient mixture. So in their case, when they used 16% sodium hydride as a mixture in dimethylacetamide, uh, it began uh, self-heating at 30 degrees. If you want to see the full plot of this, uh, you should read their paper, which I will include in the description of this video. But the products that were formed as this decomposed include acetylene, methane, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and ethane, all well above their boiling points. So while there was already gas in the headspace of this reaction, these additional gases are now present, and it's a really exothermic reaction. And so when they were using uh, this concentration of sodium hydride, they saw like several hundreds of degrees Celsius per minute increase in the mixture. So essentially that means it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, kaboom, right? Not a good time. Uh, in the next case, we have DMF. So DMF, it was a little bit sensitive at 10%, but when they did 25%, it went up like 600 degrees Celsius per minute of self-heating. And so you can see the products that were formed include acetylene, methane, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and carbon dioxide. And these are all also well above their boiling point. Finally, in the case of DMSO, it only took 10% sodium hydride and 7% mineral oil, and the onset temperature was around 55 degrees. There was a couple of thermal events at lower temperatures, but this is kind of when crap started hitting the fan. And the only two volatile products that were detected were ethylene and dimethyl sulfide, aside from any DMSO in the headspace. And so this really just highlights that these exothermic reactions, in addition to the small amounts of gas that are produced, can be a serious nightmare. And so, uh, why are they dangerous? So here you can see a picture of the bomb flask before and after detonation, or just an alternative bomb flask. And just from heating this solvent, which is just organic compounds, it's not like a typical explosive, DMSO is really safe. Just this and sodium hydride, heating it up, it exploded a metal bomb flask. It totally ruptured it and shattered metal. So this is no joke. It didn't like blow up the whole building or whatever, but it's, it's a massive amount of pressure that was created in here that ruptured steel. Right, so this is serious. Um, once this occurs, uh, once decomposition occurs, here you can see the plot of what happens thermally. Here it's how quickly is it heating up, and so basically around 55-ish, this is where it starts heating up really quickly, and this is the point where the cell actually ruptures. So once once this starts happening, the pressure goes up, which we can see over here, runs right above 50 or so. We have a PSI pressure of over a thousand, so massive pressure. Things are getting like hotter and hotter and the gases are getting like compressed, right? Tighter and tighter. And so essentially it's just gonna go kaboom. So the general conclusions from this video are that you should not mix sodium hydride with DMSO, DMF, or dimethylacetamide. It's just not worth doing. But if you decide to do it anyway, keep the reactions very cold because even dimethylacetamide had an onset of about 30 degrees Celsius. So seriously, keep them cold. Don't use a high concentration of sodium hydride if you're gonna make mixtures, right? say well below 5%, but you still should not combine them as there's many alternatives. You could use something like sodium amide, right? Uh, LDA, lithium diisopropyl amide. These are strong bases. If you're just deprotonating an alcohol, you can find a sterically hindered base which will do the job. Don't mix sodium hydride with these solvents. You could do it on a really small scale, but it's better if you don't, right? Solve this problem for yourself and don't like put yourself in danger. So hopefully this has been a useful uh, video, even though it was a special topic. If you'd like me to do more special topics like this, comment down below. And if you'd like, you could leave a like and subscribe. Have a great day.